so I'm happy to be a member of the uh, NYC Plover Project for several years. I was a volunteer and uh, this past summer uh, was able to be a little bit more of a, a member on a detail doing outreach uh, to fishermen on the shoreline here in New York City. Uh, we have Chris Alieri with the NYC Plover Project here. He's the uh, founder and director. Thanks for joining, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so if you're on Facebook, you can't see Chris. If you're on Instagram, you know you see Chris. Great. Um, so we'll spend about uh, 20 minutes to 30 minutes talking about some photos and uh, connecting them to some conservation, important conservation for these uh, endangered birds. It's the only endangered species uh, that we have here nesting in New York City, uh, this bird. And uh, without the help of the Plover Project, it'd be really, really difficult for them. And they're, they're such a local treasure. It's, how, it's great that more and more people are becoming aware of them. And uh, just, just how wonderful it is to, to have them here in New York City. They've got really great personalities. They're super cute. And uh, well, maybe I'll get into showing you the first photo. So, oh, so um, if you go to the NYC Plover Project, uh, the profile, I believe you can see the link to the live show page. Nice, okay. Great, and uh, uh, we'll be selling the photos that are uh, as part of this show, and profits will be going to the NYC Plover Project to support uh, the ongoing work that they do. I'll be talking a bit more about that as we go along. So the first photo I wanted to show, this print is, it's called Footsteps in the Shallows. So, um, I saw this bird, this is uh, uh, May of um, 2023, and I came around the beach doing an early morning shift with the Plover Project, and this guy was um, feeding on the beach just uh, on one of the shallows, the flats. And this is a time of year when the Plovers are still, they're figuring out their territory, just up ahead about from this around the beach about 100 yards they're figuring out their territory they're figuring out who their mate's going to be they haven't started laying their eggs yet and uh, so this was taking a well needed uh, feeding break down the beach so this is called footsteps in the shallows it's a it's a high key print it's on uh, an acrylic it's a beautiful high quality way to frame it it really shows the uh, the colors and the, the detail on the bird very 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 well in this one eighth inch acrylic and it uh, mounts. Well, I'm a carpenter by trade. I've, you, perhaps you know what French cleat is. That's how it, the style it mounts in the back. It's a nice, easy system for mounting. And um, yeah, love it. Happy to share this with you. Yeah, so these photos are available on um, the site, which is linked to in the NYC Plover Project site. Um, Juan, are you able to put the link up into the chat on Instagram? Um, yeah, it won't be clickable though, but I have to do this. Myself. Okay, so it's on my site. I sell photos uh, professionally, and part of my site I'm using for uh, this the the Plover Project fundraiser. It's uh, Forbes photo.click forward slash nyc dash clover dash project dash fundraiser made it really, really simple i guess um some of the things that uh, this this photo highlights uh because we're seeing the plover feeding on the shoreline is that uh, these habitats the varied habitat that they feed on is really really important protecting these beach areas um, even as the, the Plover Project tries to make more and more people aware of these birds and how they need to be able to feed freely along the shoreline. Uh, many of the people that are in this area, they're, they're fishermen. And so myself and others of the Plover Project, we do specific one-on-one -on -one outreach with them and help them to understand how crucial it is that these birds be given just a little bit of space so that they can uh, feed freely. Yeah. All right, next photo is also on... Also on acrylic, this is a uh, this is a portrait of a piping plover chick called uh, "Climbing Against the Odds," and it's uh, fittingly titled because 
these uh, birds really do have an uphill battle to survive. Their uh, parents work very hard as uh, defenders of the eggs and the nest. And once they hatch, these chicks are running around the beach and they're getting food for themselves. If some of you have raised chickens before, you may know that when a chicken comes out of the egg, as soon as the feathers dry off, they're running around looking for food on their own. And it's the same thing with the plover. There's a number of species that are like this and they rely on being able to have a comfortable, safe environment to, to go around and, and find food. And it's really amazing, you know, when we look at the sand, we don't, we don't see much down there, but you get closer. Sometimes when I'm lying on the shoreline, lying on the sand, taking pictures of them, I'm seeing all the little critters jumping up around on the sand. And this is, this is what these, uh, these little birds eat. They're, uh, when they hatch, they're so tiny. It's, they're like an inch and a half tall, and they look like little cotton balls on, uh, on toothpicks running around. Um, so one of the things that we, the Plover Project does, our volunteers, we um, work with uh, folks. We do outreach and to help them understand that these birds, especially when these ones are running around the shore, that they need lots of space. If they're afraid, they're going to run up in the grasses again. They're not going to get down to feed like they need to so that they can, they can grow and fledge. Um, and we also work with fishermen to remind them, well, remove your line from the beach. Uh, don't leave fishing line there. We talk to them about not cleaning their fish on the beach or leaving bycatch, undesirable catch on the beach, because that will attract scavengers that would then uh, um, prey upon these birds. They would be like the second course. And this photo is uh, $700. And it's also mounted on acrylic. It's, uh, it's, it's very beautiful. The acrylic really helps the details to come out and to the colors to shine. All right, next one. Okay, so this is a story. Okay, so this one called uh, uh, Watchful Guardian. This is a canvas print and it's of a mother piping plover and thank goodness for notes um, this is taken just th three days before uh the hatch and so the, the adult plovers they take turns staying on the nest and here it's mom's turn to go down to the water line to feed and uh, it posed for such a nice portrait. This is probably only a fraction of a second because they're super busy eating. They, um, since they're taking turns on the nest, you got to maximize the time feeding. And this is at low tide. So we've got a nice reflection in the bottom. This is canvas print. It's a canvas gallery wrap. It's uh, 24 by 30. It's $900. And again, it's on the live show site. I wanted to share a few things with you too about some people have asked me, many have asked like, how do you get close shots like this? Um, because it's known that photographers, we need to be uh, very careful that we're not so interested in getting the shot that we're interfering with the activity of the birds because we're down there trying to share these conservation stories with folks by taking the pictures. And so it's really crucial that we have the right equipment to be able to take good shots from a distance. And oftentimes when I go out, it's not really an opportunity to take a shot. I can't, they, they're not they're further away, uh, which they need to be. The lighting might not be right, um, but a number of factors. And so this is, this is the lens that I, that I use to, uh, to take those photos. It's a Sony 400 millimeter lens. It's got a very wide aperture, so it works uh, very well to allow me to get um, lower light shots and also I can put ex extenders on it which bring it into a really high focus and the camera that I use is not necessarily always one that uh, wildlife photographers would choose for pictures of birds uh, because the shutter rate is slower um, but it's a very, very high megapixel and I've chosen that one because it allows me to crop in tight I've got a really high megapixel count I can crop in tight on the shots, and that's what allows me to be far away from the birds and still have a, a shot that is, is printable in a large size. 
And uh, these are new binoculars I got this year. I'm not trying to it's not plug in a product, but I just trying to help you to understand that it does require specific gear to be able to monitor these birds from a distance. This is something new I got this year. It's Kite Optics. It's uh, stabilized binoculars. And this allows me to see really far, high high detail, and it stabilizes it. So even when it's really windy out where these birds are, I can count them, I can see where they are, see if they're in a nest, see if there's eggs from a really far distance, and that allows me to just let them do their thing and, and uh, not interfere. I even have a, a camera which attaches to my cell phone that's infrared, so if it's early morning, I can just see instantly, really far distance, okay, there's a little guy running around the beach. Um, so I really use these tools to allow myself to see where they are. Most times I'm trying to avoid them. Um, sometimes there'll be an opportunity to, to take a shot, but many times uh, there isn't. All right, so I showed you this one here, this um, portrait, the Watchful Guardian. And as I was going through these photos and preparing them for this evening, I come across a very, very cool detail is that this print right here of this little bird, this uh, piping clover chick, this, this is the one of the kids of uh, that plover. Um, so this was taken just, just I think, two, it's two, two or three days old at this point, a few days after that, the, pro, the um, shot was taken of the, uh, of the mom and here it is it's just hatched a couple of days before they're super tiny you can see some uh, detail in the print there we got some reflection from the light in the building here but the detail on this is really really awesome I'm very uh, very happy that this turned out well because you know I only spent a few minutes in the area where these birds were and then I had to move along uh, because um, we got to be very careful that, that we're we're staying out of their way. We're not affecting their behavior. So this one is called Golden Steps of Dawn. This is on metal. Chris, did you have a, something you wanted to say about these? Yeah, no, I did. Um, well, Benjamin, thank you so much. And hello to everyone. And, and thank you for, um, and I know right now you're actually at the Arbor and East Welcome Center. Yeah. So for our New York, yeah. may not know this place, but it's a beautiful facility in Edgemere. And um, we've done many events there from, from uh, the last few months, but we're going to continue well into next year. So actually right behind you is one yeah. of piping clover breeding grounds in New York City. Um, so it's really exciting and, and kind of symbolic that you're there. But I don't want you to go too far with that photo because that photo is is spectacular. <laughs> and I wanted I wanted you to talk about like, what time do you leave your, your house? And what time are you on the sand? How do you get those images? Because you know, I, I've dabbled in photography, as you know, and it kind of like is what struck me with the piping plovers and like kind of the way I discovered a piping plover for the first time. And I'm sure everyone's heard the story, but why I started the plover project because I saw piping plovers and nobody protecting them. Um, so that, but so tell us like how, like I know you leave at like five in the morning or something in, in, in crazy like that. Oh. Oh, five would be nice <laughs> during the summertime. Sometimes I'm at the door at uh, 4.20 in the morning. My, my, my wife is here and she knows what time I wake her up when I turn the, the, the espresso machine on in the morning <laughs> when, when the coffee grounds get made and the espresso goes on. Um, yeah, in, in the summertime, they're, they're out really early and it's a great motivation to, to get out, to see the sunrise, like the sunrise I'm not gonna try and encourage more people to go to the beach because <laughs> we know these birds need their space. But the motivation is so high for me to to go out and see these birds, to to be out in the morning and to see the sunrise. And like with with that shot, the sun is coming up behind. It's illuminating the feathers around the birds, like that that rim light effect on them, and it it's really magical. And photography can't capture the feeling that you get when you're on there. I hope to share some of that with those who purchase these prints. Uh, but yeah, I'll be up at four o'clock in the morning when it's um, in the summertime, when, when it's really early sunrise. And, and the birds will be up already. It'll be dark still, and it might be sunrise 20 minutes later, and, but the birds are up feeding. Because these birds, they're, 
They have no set schedule. They're going all over the beach at all times of the day because it, it really is a race for survival for them just to eat enough food. Um, so it's pretty cool to get up in the morning and, and to see them already. They, they beat me there to the beach for sure. Yeah. Um, it's important. You had some questions. Of, you had the question about how to get the shots, just yeah. the time. and You're kind of, I mean, just here's a little one, but like you're positioning the sun always behind you, right? Or sometimes like that, so that this, last shot actually was backlit, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it being backlit, it gives the, the rim light around so that you get the glow of the, the feathers around the around the bird. So sorry, sorry if you're on Facebook, uh, you can't hear Chris. He's in my ear. He's on Instagram. Um, wait, did I actually? Yeah. And you hear me okay on Instagram, right? I think so. Yes, I can. Okay. 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 Good. Yeah. So, so there's different kinds of shots. Some of these are they're they're lit from the front, and so you get a lot more uh, feather detail. This one is is backlit, and but my camera. One of the other reasons why I chose the camera while I'm filming right now for Facebook with this camera is it has a very wide dynamic range, so the brights can be brighter and the darks can be way darker, and that allows me to. Uh, pull up the shadows to brighten the shadows on the birds so they can still like in that photo if you see the print please purchase it uh, you can see a lot of detail on the feathers even on the front of the bird even though that part is, is in the shadow so that's work that needs to be done to just lift those areas the brightness a little bit so that detail that's in the image shows up but it's different kinds of light I mean you take what you can get with these birds because and as a wildlife and conservation photographer, the key is to not intrude on them. And if the opportunity arises to take the shot, or if I'm walking in a certain area on the beach that is the way to access the rest of the beach and the, and, and the birds decide to come close to me like 50, 60 feet for 30 seconds while I'm moving along and getting out of their way, you know, I'll drop down to the sand, I'll take a picture and then I'll move along. So. It's really uh, teaches patience, and the key is just to let the birds and let the birds live. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, so it's a balance. Yeah, it's like lose the shot or miss the shot because, I mean, literally, these birds that you're photog photographing are, I mean, you're not to go dark, but you know me, I'm always good for that. But like, um, <laughs> you um, have some of the only the images of these beings i mean so many don't survive and yeah we don't want our presence on the beach whether we are the plover project or a conservation minded photographer or a quote a birder or you know a beach goer you know or yeah. lifeguard or emergency response whomever it could be like we're all part of quote unquote the problem of you know just being another kind of nuisance to these birds right and that's the other thing too it's like oftentimes you hear the piping plover before you see them yeah. and if you hear the adult call like that, calling, yeah. um if you hear the calling um that means you're too close especially if the chicks are around they're going to let you know and um yeah yeah i think it's just like about that modeling good behavior and one thing why I so appreciate all of your images and why we post them so prolifically on our Instagram. So folks might just be meeting you for the first time, but they've known you for the last few years through the images you've you've been able to capture. So it's kind of like they've they've already known you already, Benjamin. But I think that what you've been able to do is capture the moments of these lives of these, you know, fragile lives. And that's spectacular you know and i i don't think this we could do this opportunity yeah, for sure. and I, don't, I don't think we could do this work of the plover project and get people on board i don't think we'd have nearly let me check you know almost twenty thousand followers now on instagram i don't think we would have that without these images so for that i'm truly grateful well thanks for saying chris appreciate that it's it's the it's a real treasure to 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 witness them and being out there so often in the summertime, especially the opportunity to be part of the detail doing the outreach to the uh, fishing community um, to see them so often usually just briefly or through binoculars on a daily basis and learning their habits and learning how they're different and getting to understand the ecology out there too to understand 
like how important the grass is and and these little creatures that live on the shoreline and and uh it's really given me a bigger picture too that the work that we do for the piping plovers it's not the plover project very focused on helping the birds and i'm seeing all these additional benefits of the work that the plover project does such as keeping the beach grass habitat healthy encouraging people not to go into the grasses and that's sustaining the whole habitat out there these these little grasses with their little roots there's so many of them that's what keeps the beach stable and means that we'll have a beach in a, on an ongoing basis so when the and yeah. holds holds the habitat for these birds in the coming years so it's it's all crucial out there it's been it's been a real treasure to to learn about these creatures yeah for sure sure so because it's like when the next storm comes when the next hurricane comes because it's it's not an if but when um mm -hmm. these dune systems that are so desperately needed for the residents that are living there um, yeah. another another little species that that doesn't get enough um uh airtime but it's the sea beach amaranth and that is also yeah. a protected species and it's a great little plant it's federally threatened it's it's protected under the endangered species yeah. act for decades there's a direct correlation with sea beach amaranth flourishing now especially in the rockaways but among yeah. all of long island communities um, because of the protections of piping plovers and other birds. And yeah, it's a beautiful little plant. Yeah, yeah it's cool. You could speak about how the piping plover has impacted the protection for other species, how other bird species that nest out there, how are they doing, Com you know, given the so there's, plovers? Right. And so there's a number of species that benefit from, because they're neighbors of, you know, you, you build up a neighborhood and you help you help a few neighbors, you put it in a grocery store or whatever, it's helping the whole neighborhood uh, to, to thrive. And the, like you said, the protections for the piping plovers, string lining off, which we call symbolic fencing, certain areas of the beach, it, it helps a lot because there's uh, oyster catchers, which are like big clowns the size of chickens. Uh, they're, they're, they're great, they're loud, and uh, they don't always make good neighbors for the plovers, but... Uh, they squabble a bit, but they generally get along, and they're a lot of fun to watch. There's also uh, skimmers, black skimmers, which is a really cool bird. The way that they, um, the way that they feed, I encourage everybody to after the show to look up black skimmer, and to see how how they feed and their habits. They're they're a, a beach nesting bird as well. Lay their eggs right in the sand. Oyster catchers lay their eggs in the sand. We've got a couple of species of terns that benefit from the breeding areas that are cordoned off, uh, small areas that beach that are cordoned off for the piping plover. Uh, there's the, the least tern, they're about, about this long when their wings are from, from head to tail, and uh, but they got a wingspan about like this. There's um, common terns, which are super aggressive on the beach. You walk by within 100 feet down the beach of them and they'll dive bomb you, they'll let you know they're there. Uh, it's a really rich, really rich habitat. Then like you mentioned, the CB camera, there were sections of the beach that were um, had uh, restricted access for, I think, about a month uh, in an area here uh, managed by um, NPS. And we saw sea beach amaranth sprouting up where normally there would be, uh, there'd be sunbathers and beachgoers. And they just have to walk an extra five minutes to get to the next area of the beach. So we definitely appreciate uh, their flexibility in that. But giving the beach a little bit of a chance to breathe and it, it really becomes apparent just how much of a vibrant ecosystem it is, even though it just looks like sand. Yeah. It's really incredible. I, yeah. I think, back to the common turn comment, and I just thought of this while, I, while you were saying that, and I would, just, I would just kind of, let's flip that one on its head, because I hear that sometimes from people, and you, you said nothing wrong, because it's something I would have said too, but like, you know. I love them for yeah, go to a New Yorker and, and like try to like talk to their kid or mess with their kid. What would the New Yorker yeah, right? do? You know, so I think common terns like are kind of a perfect New York bird because they're just protective of their own. They're protective yeah. of family. I think terns are some of the most spectacular creatures on the beach and um I absolutely love them. Of course piping plovers are are the best, but I know a lot of people in our in our group um, love black skimmers, and they should love them. But what I love too about these birds too is um, the colon the colonial aspect of their nest. Yeah. 
together and nesting. And what we like to see too, is sometimes those piping plovers nesting amidst the terns because terns really don't bother plovers and plovers don't really bother, mm -hmm. but they're kind of good, good bouncers for the, for the, yeah. they're a good beach patrol. Where we yeah, do, oyster catchers a bit too, yeah. Where we, we do get some challenges though, is those American oyster catchers and we do adore them too, but the pol plovers not so much. They're kind of frenemies with one another. Yeah. <laughs> and Personally, with the with the beaches getting more and more narrow and erosion and all of that and more and more people mm -hmm. going to the beach, there's less beach for these plovers and oyster catchers to choose from. So I think we're going to start to see nesting in kind of more inopportune areas like Jacob mm -hmm. Reese Park had nests the last couple of years and, you know, throughout the Rockaways, of course, like up to Far Rockaway and Arvern and Edgemere. Um, but I think we're going to see plover nests popping up in other places. And, you know, it's not about if and when we choose to protect them. They are protected under the Endangered Species Act of 1973. And so it is important to know that, you know, New York City Parks and National Park Service, Department of the Interior are, are good folks and they're doing good work, but they're also following federal law. They're doing this because they have to. And that's where we come in to sort of expand on that work, but also build the build the stewardship. And I think that happens through through the photography as well. Um, but back to your photos, because I think people really are tuning in to see that versus talking to me. Well, just on that point you mentioned, like I see a, a drastic difference. I mean, being out in a habitat in an area more often, you start to notice the subtleties and the differences. And I see a drastic difference in the area the, with the way the beach looks and how vibrant and strong the dunes are and therefore how much protection they would afford for uh, against storm, et cetera, in areas where there are plovers nesting. It's, it's, it's like a keystone species helping to kind of raise awareness and, and, and help protect uh, New York, New York, the city. Yeah. All right. So the next shot is, it's called the path to survival. And this is also this is also a metal print. And uh, again, one of the things I found out when I was doing the research and gathering the data for for this is that this little guy is the same bird as the uh, that last shot where it's backlit. And so here it's the the lighting is kind of from behind a little bit, um, and here it's running along the shore. And all these those two shots were taken actually those three shots with the the the, um, the blue background the mom and this they're all taken oh no she's three days before this and the last chick were taken within about four or five minutes of each other and then i move along it's like oh an opportunity crouch down grab the shots so this is also printed on metal um it the contrast in the image may not come through but this is just, a, just such a beautiful glow to to this image and the bird hopping along the beach so happy to capture it just when it's kind of midair and and uh, running like that. Uh, so it's a really fun shot and captures it as it's dashing to its next meal. So this is a metal print. This is $900. And um, yeah, it's got this beautiful, beautiful glow to it. I'm... I mean, I, again, these photos are so spectacular. The thought of having one in your house. I'm not an auctioneer, but I'm going to try to sell this up because these are spectacular and obviously your career is really expanding you you do have collectors now and it's very exciting to get on the ground floor with you um these images that you're holding are ready to go you know and i think that's really exciting too you could have this up in your house or your apartment by the end of the year that's pretty exciting um and i i, don't, I just don't know I, I i think i can think of nothing more spectacular than to have one of these images of a plover chick in in your house in your home i think it could be or your office so i think this could be spectacular too for an office um a law office a doctor's office <laughs> could be anywhere um a restaurant would be fantastic in a restaurant um yeah it's a classic it's, new york classic new york bird they're cute and it's a there's they got a lot of personality it's a conversation piece because it's a piece where you'd have to tell the story. So you, they'd, they'd talk to you and they'd find out more because then they could tell the story too. And I think that that's the, the power of these images too and the power of actually 
let's let's be real we all love instagram we love sharing these images online but like to have and to hold this image yourself and to be able to have it on your wall i'm in a hotel right now so i've got some hotel art but if we were able to like if you're able to have this and then share it with your family and friends or if you have a business with your customers or your clients i mean it could just be so so powerful because it just would touch hundreds of lives thousands of lives because they'd want to know more about that image yeah they're they're very unique they're eye-catching and i love them yeah <laughs> that's clear so at the most usually they'll have thanks Juan. at the most they'll usually so uh, someone on instagram asked how many babies that uh, the the plovers uh, if you're in canada you say plover i'm canadian i I say plover because I don't want to, you know, in, get in trouble with the New Yorkers here. You can say uh, some great, very good people. Anne Hex says plover, and she's <laughs> the, the East Coast or the Atlantic Coast um, recovery lead for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So she's kind of like the queen of the plovers. So she <laughs> says plover. So we'll, you know, you can say plover. <laughs> so someone on Instagram has asked, how many chicks do they normally have? So uh, this family here. She she had, I think, I have it here. How many eggs did she lay? Uh, four eggs. She laid four eggs. All of them hatched. And, and um, can I share a little more history, Chris? Or, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> on this bird. So she laid four eggs. Uh, all four hatched. It's uncommon common in our area for all four chicks to survive. We've had some with uh, three chicks survive. This particular uh, mom and uh, her, her mate, they had one chick that fledged. So it could be uh, predators along the beach. It may be garbage that was left that attracted scavengers that then come in, um, that can then see the chicks and eat them opportunistically. It, uh, I've seen two chicks that were um, killed from uh, squashing. One was in a beach sandal. There was a beach sandal print there. Another one was in a vehicle track. So she had four eggs and of that one of them, one of them fledged. And just because of the date of the photograph, I know that this, this was the chick that survived. So hopefully it went, hopefully it came back here to breed. We don't, you know, we don't have a banding program here, so we don't know who comes back, um, but hopefully that was one of the ones that survived and made it back here. Maybe it would, maybe it nested here this summer too. We don't know, but the, this was a, a success story here. So I'm pretty happy to share that particular image. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we are starting right. to see, you know, some, sometimes the clutches are less eggs. Um, sometimes they call uh, it's kind of in a continuation nest. Maybe um, those first eggs were predated. Uh, uh, someone got the egg. Uh, crows oftentimes will get them, um, raccoons mm -hmm. can get them, um, or more likely what's happening in the Rockaways a lot is uh, tides. So if they, mm -hmm. if they sighted the nest, if the parents put a place where the nest seemed like a good spot, but then the tides come, they may continue, if they were just laying that nest, they may continue that nest someplace else nearby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that takes me to uh, back to this image right here of uh, um, the, this one of the plover in the shallows. So this one, because of the area that it's in and that these birds are territorial, uh, we can be pretty confident because records are kept by NPS of which nests survive and which don't. Just because of the area that I saw this in, this is likely one of the of a mate uh, of a pair that that lost their um, that lost their, their nest a couple of days after this shot was taken. Um, it was a flooding event and it was the, the tide was just, I think it, I checked the tides a couple of days ago to see the history of the photo back at that time. And the tide was only three inches higher than the tide the day before, but it was a full moon and they really thread the needle on, on where they have their nests. And, and so this, this guy and, uh, and his mate, they lost their eggs, and it, it was early enough in the season. I don't know if they re-nested that year, but we've seen in this past year, we've, I saw 
they were they were in the same area as this pair and they failed to, it uh they lost three nests in a row yeah um once uh, twice because of flooding and then their third attempt the chicks ticks didn't make it i guess it was just too late in the season but uh they really don't give up they're they're tenacious and um i saw a pair after i found a chick in a, in a, ty- a tire track one time and you can just see them they just i mean maybe we're putting emotions into them but they just look despondent it's uh yeah you were, you were, they're just standing I, there watching i remember remember that phone call when you called me that morning and you were out there and I first thing I said to you is where are the parents and they're like and you said they're they're right here watching yeah 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 it was a it was a difficult day I saw the tracks on the beach and I followed them just dreading that I would see uh, a chick in it yeah it was uh, it was very difficult they renested yeah. they renested they you know they, they take a while to recover perhaps emotionally <laughs> We don't know what we can attribute to them, but I've seen a lot of plovers and I've watched them feed and I've watched them look after their chicks. And I don't know, they just, they look sad. They look sad. Yeah. But on the, flip, um, on the flip side, you also could tell us about how, you know, on the beach this year, you know, a little bit further to the east at a beach we call West Beach, but then a little bit further to the west. We saw for the first time since the Plover Project started, we saw two pairs have three surviving plover <laughs> chicks and fledged them. yeah and that is unheard of on our busy urban beaches yeah. you know i think yeah. Massachusetts, yeah. times in new jersey other places um it's rare everywhere everywhere that piping plovers nest to have three or four or two of four or two of three i mean to have that is spectacular and it I think we have a small part in it, but I think most of it comes from the resilience and the, the just how how great the parents and the protectiveness of this this little bird. I think that they think that they're lions or elephants sometimes because they're small. <laughs> they do. Yeah, but don't tell them they're small because I don't think that they know. <laughs> yeah, no, this this one right here, like, yeah, when you're walking down the beach and the beach is narrow, so and at this time the the uh, the chicks hadn't hatched. Um, so the beach was still available for people to walk by. And so it's important that us as volunteers take a quick peek, see what's going on. And if there's people out there to do outreach to them and the opportunity happened, maybe we'll able to take this shot. Um, but these birds, you know, if they got something going on, if they got eggs or they've got chicks, they'll come down and they'll watch, they'll walk by you like this. They'll be staring up at you and giving you the stink eye. It's like, hey, uh, you know the deal, move along, buddy. <laughs> yeah. yeah they're, they're they're just such a precious treasure these things they're pretty awesome um speaking of true new yorkers can i move along to the uh next one here this one is uh very excited to be able to have captured this shot right here this one i call uh between tides and towers so if you're a New Yorker, if you've seen some skyline, you know which building this is here in the background, the Empire State Building. Uh, so to be able to capture the New York City skyline with a piping plover in it, that's something I've been trying to do for years. And again, it's just if the opportunity happens, if it's safe for them to take the shot. Uh, so this uh, required uh, the right light, the right situation, and to have the bird here looking out over New York City, it's a, kind of a poignant shot, I think. Uh, this is a um, very large print. It's 42 by 28, it's $1,400. Again, the profits to the, the sale of any of these pieces goes to the Plover Project. I, my work is self-funded. You know, I buy my own equipment. Um, so after the printing and production costs of these, the, the profits are going to the NYC Plover Project. So you're able to hold, have uh, some really cool art on your wall, a very unique New York piece, I feel. And uh, whoever this goes to, I'm very happy for them. Yeah. So this this shot was actually taken on, I believe, March 17th of this year. It was the day when the Plover Project had organized a group of volunteers, along with the National Park Service, to uh, go do a beach cleanup in this area. And I believe this is a couple days before this. I saw one other plover in a a different area of the beach. And then being able to see this one 
right before a cleanup, knowing we're going out to, uh, and I help with that, to, to go and take some garbage off the beach, remove the plastics um, and other things to help keep, provide them with a safe environment to see this guy looking out over New York City. So he's looking out over Jamaica Bay, over towards uh, Manhattan. Yeah, I love, love this one. Juan, were there any other questions coming in? Yes, questions. Uh, is asking how do people suggest ways to work, especially in the moment when we might see people damaging health or threatening or unwittingly their wives. Can you hear that, Chris, or should I repeat? No, I didn't. Go ahead, please. Okay, so how do we, we how do we, what question came through? I think you said from Hugh, Juan? Yeah. Yeah, so Hugh asked, so I'm listening to the Facebook uh, stream and Instagram is in my ear. Um, so Hugh for, uh, asked, how can we raise awareness, particularly when there are people doing things, I'm paraphrasing, where they're putting the birds at risk or uh, things that are not, not good for the species, not good for, for the birds. Is that correct, Juan? Yes. Yeah. So we want people, the real goal of the outreach that we do, that I personally have, when I approach someone is I'd really like to help this person not to just do the right thing right now, but to have them understand how important it is to do the right thing when nobody's looking. Yeah. And so the Plover Project, how many hours of volunteer work has the Plover Project done so far since inception? Like 10,000, is it? No, a very conservative number is 15,000. Um, oh. That's in four seasons. So that's, yeah. it's pretty sizable. But we have a lot of volunteers, Yolanda, if you're listening, um, who's out there every day and she doesn't yeah. log her hours, but we absolutely adore her. And if you ever go to the beach and you meet someone named Yolanda, you will adore her too. Our volunteers, Mercedes, Yolanda, Victoria, Victoria, we have three, two Victorias. I mean, we have some spectacular volunteers. We've got think, you know, Matt in the room yeah. here. He's been out there a lot. Oh my he God. came in for the live show. He's, Matthew's fantastic. <laughs> he's here. Born and raised in Rockaway Beach, just like some of these plovers. Um, you know, I think it's important that um, what, we, what we're realizing, what we're up against is not so much that people are knowingly doing something wrong or doing something bad. They just don't know. You know, they might want to mm -hmm. bring their dog and let their dog run loose on the beach. I mean, if I had a dog. Which I'd dogs run, love. Right? Right. You understand. But like just to know that like a dog is perceived, even if the dog is a nice dog or a small dog, is perceived as a as a predator and you know and i think that if a conversation can happen and if it's in a voice a tone of voice like we're having right now and if we mm -hmm. can you know educate but also inspire and evoke some sort of interest then then we build a partnership and we build a stewardship and that's what we hope to do and so you know our volunteers are trained but we also spend a lot of time you know with folks to to so that they can meet the plover they can meet their neighbor that they may not have may never have met before you know our community engagement director mel julian born and raised right there where you're standing nearby mel's in the background oh, okay hello i don't know if she uh, no you're not tuned in on instagram right so you can't hear what we're saying <laughs> we're giving you some props mel yeah so she's you know um you know lives in edgemere and you know what to tell her story or to borrow from her story which i've heard and been inspired by so many times is that she didn't even know about the piping plovers until she saw her Instagram. And, mm. and so maybe somebody right now listening and maybe they wanna learn more. And I mean, listen, I was no expert in this too. And now here I am the director, but like, I think that, you know, for me, we have a big tent and we want everyone to join. And if you can join us as a volunteer, that's wonderful. So next month, and it, it it's a little, makes me a little nervous to say this, but next month in January, we will do our first information session for the 2025, um, I almost said school year. It does feel like the school <laughs> year, but it is the 2025 nesting year. And this will be our fifth season on the beach. And that's pretty exciting. And um, yeah. so, you know, we, we are looking for volunteers. Uh, we ask for a seasonal commitment. If you can come once a week, that's wonderful. People like Matthew are there several times a week. People like you are there pretty much every day. Um, and so, you know, but if you come less, that's wonderful too. We just love to have people 
commit kind of between May and August. So it's not that long. Um, but yeah, we, we really do back to that question. There are outliers, there are people who are mean spirited and want to do harm, but they're very few. And, you know, we do partner with um, city parks and, and as well National Park Service. And, you know, there are park rangers and US Park Police that are there to enforce the rules. And those rules are important because it is a federally protected species. But mm -hmm. thankfully, most people, once they learn, once they see your photos, once they've seen the videos, um, they want to join and they want to be a part of this movement that we started in March of 2021. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a big hurdle, the knowledge gap, but thankfully, once the information is shared, most people are mm -hmm. happy to um, to just adjust their habits a little bit, do things a little bit differently because it makes the, the world of difference to these to these birds and the habitat they live in and the preservation of the beach uh, as a whole. So I was saying earlier, like we want to be able to motivate people so that when we're not there, when park service is there, park police or somebody in a blue shirt, the Clover volunteers, uh, when they're not there, the people will still do what what is good for the, the habitat and good for these birds. And so like I've seen like myself, my approach has matured over the years. Um, I'm much happier after interactions that I have with people because I've learned, you know, it's even if it seems really critical, we really need people to understand and, and to accept and to, un, and to, uh, to continue to do what's good for this good for this species and good for the whole ecology and good for the beach in general to protect that resource. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have more smiles on my face beginning and end of a shift now than I, than I have in the past. You get really anxious. Oh my goodness, I see a dog and we know that the birds might flee and they might leave their chicks, but try and go to the person, commend them on their dog. I mean, commend them, hey, what a cute dog you have. It seems like you may not be aware of this. And the reason is, is because, you know, your dog's super cute to me. It's nice to me. Look, it's licking my hand. <laughs> but only thing the plover sees is this is a deadly predator. I think I can, because in, in, in regular habitat, in the environment, if a species like that, like if it was a wolf or a coyote, they've just learned, oh my goodness, there's this wolf or coyote here, and this is its territory, and my family will never be safe here. And so they may see the dog and just completely abandon their nest. Uh, at the very least, the chicks will be hiding and not feeding for, for quite some time. Uh, so it really is critical to obey, uh, to follow the guidelines, to just adjust your behavior a little bit, to be good New Yorkers to these New Yorkers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What All right, I've got, uh, sorry, go ahead. What other images do you have? I have. We've got oh. this print right here. <laughs> so this is really special to those of us who've been in the Plover Project for a while. And if you've been following the uh, NYC Plover Project Instagram for some time, this is the, we hope, world famous Clark Kent. And uh, uh, yeah, man, uh, he was, uh, he, he saw my presence on the beach and uh, I was, do my best to walk by and leave them alone because they had um, nest eggs in the nest at the time. But uh, yeah, he came up close. He came up close and jumped down on the sand, laid down on the sand, got my camera really low, grabbed the shot, and then uh, moved along. But uh, yeah, this is uh, this is Clark Stink Guy right here. That's not the name of the photo, <laughs> but if you know plovers, this is some, this is uh, this is a look. This is a look for sure that indicates that. Uh, we're we're in his home. We're in his territory. Yeah. And uh, Clark was with us. Clark was with us until 2023. Um, and after this shot was taken, I think it was only a couple days after this that was it three or four eggs on their nest hatched. Uh, Sorry, we had four that year. This is the the final nest last year there were four but yeah I really only saw three viable chicks um and then it was down to two and then it was one but that one was yeah. um what yeah. we know of to be clerks um there may have been a fledgling in 2020 but in 21 and 22 there were no surviving fledglings so right. that um you know last year was one fledgling that we know of that he had 
Yeah, yeah. So this photo, that photo was taken on May 6th of 2023. Um, it's a large um, luster print framed with a basswood, natural basswood frame. The size is 28 by 35. Wow, that's huge. It's very, yeah, very nice, nice large. Um, and it's, it's got a lot of, managed to capture a lot of, the lighting was, again, it's, it's just the opportunity, the lighting was right. There's a lot of really nice detail even in the eye, in in the feathers, you can see the color of his leg bands. You know it's Clark, yeah. and uh, it, he's that, really giving a great look. We post that image often, and I will post that image. Continue to post that image often because it is probably my most favorite image that we have of the Plover Project, and it it is spectacular. And to have that image framed in that size would be so special. And so whoever purchases this is gonna to have to beat me to it, but I hope you do. Um, <laughs> what, is the, what is the price of that? 1,400. Gosh, that's, that's a steal for that image. It is so wonderful. The size, it is enormous. It'll just perfectly fill your wall. Um, you know, a little bit about Claire Kent. Um, you know, one of the first Plover images that I took, um, photography, mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, a year before the Plover Project, um, I looked back at my images and I looked closely and there were little bands and there was a little yeah. blue band and a little green band and a little pink band yeah. and a yellow. And I was like, oh my goodness, it's Clark. And then a year later and in 2021 and in 22, the first Plover we saw in March as we were putting up the symbolic fencing the second or third week of March, we would see almost two, like clockwork, we would see Clark watching us, sort of supervising us as we put up. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, yeah. they don't miss a thing. Yeah. Unfortunately, in 21, we lost, Clark's nest was destroyed purposely by vandals. Mm. And in 22, um, all of his chicks were predated within, you know, 20 hours, you know, mm -hmm. less than a day. But yeah. to have nest last year survive the fledgling and unfortunately this year you know one of our biggest challenges this year was not seeing Clark um, right it's unlikely that he will return he was six so that is within the range of their expectancy but um, he will continue to touch the lives of so many people and New Yorkers and be an inspiration for the work that we continue to do I hope so yeah it was a really special bird. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a real treasure. Like having the catalog of photos that I have, uh, especially uh, with, with this campaign, and I'll, sometimes we'll just go through the images and have a look and, and uh, see what I have of Clark or some of these other birds that, that I kind of became real special to me because I saw them regularly. And Clark is, is uh, definitely way up there. And to be able to have a species like this that's banded um, it just makes such a nice difference because we know it's him. We know it was him, and they're able to become ambassadors for the species. It's something that, uh, like, um, like Michigan, there they have uh, named birds, and like, uh, and around the Great Lakes they have named birds, and it's becoming a bit of a celebrity there. So having species ambassadors like Clark here, yeah, we certainly hope that that will, you know, be a reality one day. Yeah. That we can do the banding and. You know, I think that too is also um, knowing Clark's story, that he was born in New Jersey, just like me. Yeah. And um, he <laughs> spent his first steps on the sand of Southern Ocean County, just like me, um, the Jersey Shore near Barnegat Lighthouse, he was born on oh, Island yeah. Bay Park, just across the water from, my, um, from Barnegat Lighthouse. And uh, Kashi Davis and the New Jersey Fish and Wildlife crew were his banding, um, oh. uh, banding and, you know, we've, you know, Kashi and the crew in New Jersey yeah. have been supportive of our work in New York. And also through the banding reports and things, we know that Clark spent more than one winter in Andros, Bahamas, and was seen during his migrations in Georgia. So that banding um, is really helpful. It does not hurt the bird. They don't mind it. They probably hate that day that they get banded. But that band um, does not impact their lives or their, you know, their work about being a plover, but it does tell us so much and it gives us a sense of life expectancy, how many birds are surviving, um, where they go, all of the things. Yeah, yeah, miss them, we'll miss them a lot.
we'll hold out for a miracle that maybe he would maybe he decided to go further east or maybe he head back headed yeah back. maybe and then his mate his mate last year too was a banded bird uh, she looked real young she didn't even have the black headband she had a very youthful look it kind of whenever i saw the two of them together like yeah he got he robbed the cradle a little bit when he got when he got that bait she's she's a really cute little thing his uh, his mate last year and she was fierce i've got these images of her on her own taking on two adult oyster catches and she just dove right in there and she was in the middle of the mouth wide open and yeah she's she was a fierce fierce little thing hopefully she's still with us somewhere yeah me yeah. Too. yeah that that was uh that was the last image so hopefully we've been able to kind of capture some of the um, conservation story for these birds and if if you're watching please consider purchasing a print that will support the NYC Plover project and uh, the funds because most participants are volunteers this organization uses the funds so well it's a very lean well operating group um, that can really it's really able to accomplish a lot um, but there is a big need for funds because well Chris what are some of the programs that we have uh, done in the past yeah, for sure. So we're because of um, with due to our fundraising and with some great support from Patagonia and from New York Community Trust and the John and Margaret Post Foundation and um, um, and the Moore Foundation and some individuals, very, uh, very um, uh, generous individuals. And of course, the National Park Foundation. I d didn't mean to leave them off, but um, we've been able to expand our work in public schools, uh, specifically the National Park Foundation, together with um, uh, Gateway National Park Service. We are now in the Rockaway Park High School for Environmental Sustainability. And our, cool. our um, education director has been kicking off that work, and she's been doing a ph phenomenal job there. And um, through the leadership of our community engagement director, Mel Julian, we have done um, something like 15 free bird walks. And now yeah. with a donation of binoculars, which we will be announcing soon, uh, a partner there, um, we're going to be doing even more events there. And um, we're also doing more engagement with elected officials to remind them that uh, protecting piping plovers is something that can empower all of us New Yorkers and make our city better, safer, more compassionate, more resilient overall. And then last but not least, our volunteer effort, our award-winning mm -hmm. volunteer effort. We were named Volunteer Group of the Year for the entire National Park Service uh, two years ago. And, you know, that work, um, we hand out information and materials on the beaches. Our volunteers have a volunteer uniform. And so we are lean and mean. I, you know, our staff um, is paid. We want to, I am unpaid, but we want to continue to pay our staff. Um, not me, I'm not paid, um, and that is okay. Um, but, you know, for us fundraising um, folks to do this work. And then last but not least, the work that you're going to be doing, Benjamin, with this is angler outreach, uh, fishermen and fisherwoman outreach on the beaches specifically of Breezy Point is really important to build that shared stewardship with the angler community. And that's something that we're really looking forward to. So it's short to say that like all of this all of this support is is going directly to these programs. This is the time of year. It's the middle of December. Everyone is asking for money. We're also going to get online and ask you as well. But with this effort, with this with this um, fundraiser, you're able to get one of these spectacular images. The sale will continue well into next week. So do stay tuned. Um, we will continue to post about this. I did put in the link. Um, the URL to your um, online gallery and the purchase information. It's very easy to use. So huge thanks to your partners. Maybe you want to plug them. Uh, but again, yeah, thank, for sure. Yeah. Thank you again, everyone for joining. And we do hope that you will support this beautiful art show. Yeah, yeah, please do. A, uh, thanks to um, the uh, hoster that hosts my uh, website for the photos, Art Storefronts. If you're a photographer, check them out. Lots of really good support from them. And um, Juan is, uh, is kind of emceeing in the background here for us. Thanks, Juan, very much. And I uh, really appreciate the support from all of you and uh, the kind way. Thank you in advance for the kind way that you treat the birds and for helping us um, look after the ecology out here in the Rockaways and uh, the uh, National Park area. Uh, Juan, were there any questions before we finish up? Can you have a good question? 
Ali's from Okay, so it's from Ali. She's asking if you can walk them through on how the buying process. Is it just the individual pieces for sale? Or do they have the choice of different materials and formats? So these, so the question from Ali, you said, right? On Instagram? Yes, Ali. Ali. Okay, so Ali, uh, you asked about how, what's the process on, on purchasing these? Um, so if, if you don't have the link, maybe you can reach out to me directly afterwards. Well, I guess both of us, uh, Chris with the Plover Project site and myself, will we'll make sure that the link is up on our profiles. So these are uh, one of a kind um, limited edition prints. And so what that means is these prints in the formats that I've chosen because they were suitable for, for those images and they really struck me they'll only be produced in that size and in that format uh, this one time. So there'll be an addition of one. And so if you purchase um, from this, the live show site, which just has these seven prints on them, it'll be a signed copy. Um, and uh, if you purchase by 8 p.m. tonight, I'll be able to get it out shipping to you tonight so that you can get it within, within however long UPS takes um, at, this, at this time of year. They tell me that it's able to arrive before December 24th. Uh, so if you purchase this evening before 8 p.m., that gives me enough time before I go on a, a bit of an expedition, some birding and some family visiting uh, over the next few weeks. So order this evening and it'll get out to you this evening. So by 8 p.m. Uh, if you want some other sizes, so there's two sites. There was the site that we have, the one page with these prints uh, specifically, shows the price. There's a buy now. You click the link on that page. So ForbesPhoto.click forward slash NYC dash Plover dash project dash fundraiser. Should have made it easier. It's actually on your Instagram bio. Yeah, okay. So there's that page, the live show this evening for these uh, very limited uh, edition signed prints. But we also have had another page up in which we will for another couple weeks with uh, print on demand prints. Uh, and I believe most of these images are up there, but in, in different formats and different sizes. And so those would be. Uh, you, once you, if you purchase those, uh, you have a number of options to choose. There's different formats. There's the acrylic, there's the metal, there's the canvas wrap, and you can get the uh, fine art paper prints like Clark was printed out in. You can get just the print itself and mount it yourself, uh, or you can choose a number of different frame styles there. Um, and uh, yeah, you'll, so that's the, that's the second site. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that that information is all available. And that, because that's print on demand, as soon as you order that, whether it's tomorrow or the next day, if it's within the production schedule, they, you know, they're, they're putting them out within a couple of days. I've, I've seen, I don't know what their, the printer schedule is right now. I think things get a lot busier for them. But you go to that site and you, you, make the, you choose your options, you make the purchase, and it'll ship directly to you. For these uh, prints that I showed this evening, again, it's, if you want it right away, order by 8 p.m. I can get it out to you this evening. We'll package it up. I'll sign it. I'll send it to you. And uh, if you order after 8 p.m., then it'll ship uh, uh, the first week of January. But they'll be signed. And I'll also be following up with purchasers to send you a certificate of authentication of, uh, of these prints. Is that clear? I think so. And if that if they have any uh, doubts, they can always contact us through any of our social media. Um, they can contact um, through our website. So um, if you want to print, you can find out. We'll give you the answers for sure. And we're so supportive. And yeah, if you can make it arrive by the 24th with your deadlines and things, and that these are deadlines that are unfortunately are hard deadlines with, with Postal Service and UPS and things. But I'd say that the, if you're giving this as a gift, this is a gift that people can wait until January as well. Um, and also the best gift is the gift you give yourself. So, <laughs> so I think says the youngest child. Um, so I think you definitely owe yourself. Um, it's been a, it's been a long tough year for some of us. And so I think um, 
what a wonderful, spectacular way to start 2025 with one of these images arriving at your door sometime in the middle of January. I think that would be pretty spectacular. So if you can't make it happen for tonight, um, go ahead and try to purchase one of these beautiful images that are standing you know, on these easels right behind Benjamin. Um, we definitely look forward to seeing them in people's homes. And once you get them, maybe take a photo and um, send it to us and we will post it. On our Instagram. We will gladly um, share um, with your permission, of course, but we'll gladly share the image um, on your walls. Um, that would make us so proud and so, so happy. For sure. Any other questions, Juan? Uh, I think we're good. Okay, I, I guess that's a wrap. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Chris, you're out of the city, but you tuned in. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your um, inspiration to all of us in the Plover Project uh, through the years, and your determination is pretty cool, and uh, your inspiration for us. And we've got a few Plover Project people here in the building, some volunteers. We've got Mel, and my wife is here. So thank you, everybody, and thank you all out there for, for joining us. Please be kind to the birds, be kind to nature, and uh, we appreciate your support very much. And I guess that's a wrap. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.